Hey, hey. Now we're going to finish off the previous discussion of species diversity with a little bit of talk about community composition and assembly. I just wanted to break, grab some more water, and we're good. Um, okay. So we talked about alpha diversity, which is the number of species in the community. We talked about beta diversity, which is the dissimilarity between communities. We talked about gamma diversity, which is the regional species richness, basically. So the regional diversity. Um, now I'm gonna go into details about uh, community composition and assembly. And so still talking about communities, but considering the temporal dynamics. All right, so now I'm sharing my screen, the same screen as last time, my own course, crappy notes. Um, okay. So what we mean by community composition tends to be just the identities of species that are present in a community. This is not something that's estimated by species richness since species richness is just a raw number. It's a count of number of species that are present. Composition actually considers the fact that maybe the species is, and these are your communities, so they, I don't want to muddy concepts. So let's go back here. Um, composition may consider like things like species body size. And so this one's very large and it exists there. Um, or just the different roles that the species play in, in communities. But it actually it considers their identities as unique species. Um, so one thing about sort of community composition is that species are interacting such that uh, in a way that could promote diversity. So keystone species are a good example of this. It's a species that tends to be fairly small in number, typically, um, relative to the impact that it has on a community. And so um, I think maybe the, the most foundational example is uh, the, the pisaster, the sea star, um, which eats mussels. And so here we're defining a community in a more inclusive way to mean a, basically a set of interacting species that can include predator prey relationships. And before we were sort of like, uh let's let's try to keep it in the same trophic level now we're like now let's include this other trophic level uh, at least for the definition of a keystone species um and so basically there's this experiment where like we so uh we wanted to see the effect of pisaster on the, on the um basically the food web or a little community and so they removed um pisaster the sea star from the um the intertidal area and it uh caused a huge influence to the muscle population and subsequent community. So it's just like the modification either through removal or through addition of a species causes a disproportionate effect on the community structure. You can also imagine a situation um, where these keystone species, these uh, a species is very, very important to um, either promoting or reducing diversity of certain species in the community. Um, but it's actually a, a sort of requirement. And these species are called foundation species. An example of this would be um, a, a mammal or some, some animal that creates uh, a type of habitat that is required for another species. And so if there's like um, some species that comes out and just like mashes holes in trees just for fun, that species could be required for uh, nesting birds or cavity nesting birds to come in. Um, yeah, I give the example of a, a bird that creates holes for other species to live in as a consequence of foraging behavior. It's like a woodpecker is like pecking into wood. Maybe that pecking into the wood allows another species to come in and, and burrow in where it otherwise it wouldn't have been able to. Foundation species. All right. Okay, um, and so community composition being the identities of the species that are present in a site. And here we determine, and here I accidentally say structure. Some people say community structure. Doesn't, I'm not really going to go into that. We'll go into more of the, the, diff, the distribution of abundance within a community um, beyond the rank abundance plots, which are featured in the right screen, uh, right here. 
um, maybe in like the macro ecology lecture, which is toward the end of the course, but otherwise we won't really touch on that, that sort of evenness and, and getting at that. Um, so what influences community composition? First and foremost, it's just the environment, right? And so the uh, species that can persist in a given landscape, barring no interactions and competition or predation or otherwise, um, that gray box is defined by the environment. Um, that the, the ability of these species is defined by, to persist in this gray box is defined by their niches. So environmental conditions are important. Uh, geographic location of the site. So things like human disturbance or like dispersal limitation. If it's like an island out in the middle of nowhere where it's really hard to get species there, that's gonna limit community uh, composition. Species interactions can also determine or influence community composition. So remember we talked about niche overlap and competitive exclusion <clears throat> at the community level that can also influence like, what ends up there. So you think if this species just kept increasing and increasing and increasing, it would eventually, if these species, like assuming these species are directly interacting for a shared resource, could drive the second species extinct. Um, and then lastly, and sort of, of course, like naturally, um, the regional species pool. So that gamma diversity, which does differ, especially like it depends on how you define the region, um, but species diversity in terms of regional species diversity is distributed non-randomly across space. And so we'll go over how that is the case later when we talk about things like the latitudinal diversity gradient, um, which I won't go over right now, but we will go over at some point in this class. All right, um, but there's, there's a, a distinction that should be made. So here it says community composition and assembly. Composition and assembly are two different things. Composition is just the, the identities of the species that are present at a given site at a given time. Assembly is the temporal process of how that community takes shape and turns into whatever community it is, is stable. Um, yeah, community assembly is the set of processes by which communities are formed is how I'm defining it here. And this temporal axis is super important um, and has sort of uh, interested ecologists for many, many years. Um, and so the two ecologists that sort of first posited, I think one was like a biogeographer, I don't know, that started talking about um, ideas of temporal community assembly, they define it as succession. So think about those are sort of equivalent, succession and temporal community assembly. We'll go over sort of why they might not be um, the same thing in a bit. Because um, succession sort of assumes a directional process, which I never really liked. Um, yeah, so I'm still looking at my notes from last year. All right, yeah. Man, so many think pair shares that we're just missing. <laughs> All right, um, so succession. Is it is temporal process. So let's I'm go down here and create this axis of time. All right, so now we have our time where this is the start of time and this is the end of time, not the end of time. It's just sometime in the future. Um, and then we're gonna have communities. All right. And so at some time, T, I'm gonna change this color because it's confusing to have the community bounds be the same. Okay. So let's say there's three periods at which we sampled the community. <coughs> if this were the case, if we saw the community started with four species, it then has four species at time two, and then at the lab, most recent time step, we'll call time three, has four species. No, that's not succession. That's just a community stably doing its thing. Um, the, the process of succession assumes that you start with a blank slate. And so there's two type, different forms of succession that people refer to, and it's primary succession or secondary succession. Primary succession is when you have this completely clean slate. 
a volcano erupts and destroys every species that is in a community. It is a blank slate which to be colonized by species in a regional species pool. Secondary succession means that there's already still some species there, um, but this it was perturbed in a way that, that removes a bunch of the species, but not all. Um, and then we can look at the change of over, over time. And so let's say what the, it's the, this site, which is undergoing primary succession, is first colonized by these two species. And then by time three, one of the species is, is competitively excluded out and um, these other two new species come in. So we see changes in species richness going from zero to two to three and also in composition where the blue one appears but only for a little bit before it, it uh, gets excluded. And we'll talk about how it can get excluded and what the sort of different processes are leading to different forms of succession. Um, but first I wanna talk about um, ideas around succession and, um, and how they formed. And so the two main people arguably who were pushing forward um, ideas about succession in the early days were uh, Gleason and Clements. And so, um, yeah, they, they, both of them actually sort of gave very um, directional views of succession. They argued that like this final community is almost like deterministic, meaning like there's always going to be these three species at the end. And it's just understanding what happens in this middle ground that is, uh, that is the bit of succession. Which I, so they, they'd call this the climax community. This is like when the dust is settled and this is going to like stably persist forever. That's the climax community. Um, but they talked about it in different ways. They thought it, it, it happened in different ways. And so Clements argued that successional dynamics, um, well, they both believe in the climax community. Get out of here with that. I'll change that in the notes, make a note of it. Um, yeah, and so basically as Gleason said that individuals respond um, across this sort of uh, successional gradient of time that they blink in and out um, individualistically. They have, they have individual responses to the environment that allows them to colonize at, at, at different stages. Um, and meanwhile, um, Clement said that, and I drew this, but I can't draw it in, in Inkscape. Clement said that there's groups of species that colonize and then blink out. Um, and so maybe this, this early community has th these two set of species that always occur that have this, um, that come in and then are subsequently replaced by a different pair of species. This would more fit with um, the Clemencian um, view of, of succession. And there's tons wrong with, with, um, with both of us. Uh, yeah, I, I talk about that, have largely abandoned the idea of climax community and succession in general is sort of thought about much differently now, but it's good to understand the sort of um, the basis for it. The idea that um, this temporal change in community composition can lead towards something where you're changing and following diversity through time. Um, and I actually already went over <clears throat> the idea of the competition colonization trade-off, I think in the niche lecture, but I'll, I'm also going to sort of go over it again here because it relates to successional dynamics. And it's basically the, uh, how to explain how, why early colonizing species might drop out and, uh, and sort of what the colonization and like, successional path would look like. And so, um, here you, you have completely flat earth. This is primary succession. Um, the composition, competition and colonization trade-off says that species that are really good at colonizing this blank patch are also really poor competitors. And so these two species in time got to this community first and were able to like quickly like shoot up and maybe make some seeds or like make some young um, to then disperse off. However, at least this blue species by this time period has already been excluded. 
Uh, and so this species would be a good colonizer and not a good competitor. Meanwhile, these yellow and they, the uh, yellow and red species take a little bit longer to get to the site, but once they do, they're able to outcompete the initial colonizers. Okay, and what I just described is um, has been, and what I've described sort of approach succession, at least like I don't know, kind of has been autogenic succession. Succession is when the competitive landscape changes in a way to favor certain species at certain stages of succession. So I said this blue species was competitively excluded from this community, but that doesn't have to be the case, right? That could be, that would be autogenic succession. However, and so uh, I give one more detail on the notes here. Um, uh, form of historical contingency, kind of is, yeah. Um, and so I give an example of a large uh, plant with big leaves that can establish in an early successional plot and, and shade out um, certain other plants, um, but allow or, allowing certain plants or certain other species that have certain characteristics like shade tolerance to invade. Um, so that would be a form of like a plant coming in or a species coming in and altering a competitive landscape in a way that it determines or it affects later changes. It's a form of historical contingency. Meanwhile, allogenic succession is, what if we consider these, <clears throat> these sites, when you like scorch the earth, so to speak, in terms of primary succession, this site can change in its environmental conditions as a function of time, right? And so I'm gonna show that as a darkening of the gray. All right, so here, like we start off and we're light gray and then we're medium gray and these two species come in, um, but environmental conditions of so things like uh, here, have a soil moisture, nitrogen availability um, can change, both as a function of the legacy of whatever opened up this patch. And so if it was a fire, fire releases a bunch of nitrogen immediately, which is then consumed by these initial colonizing plants. And so nitrogen availability or something at some other environmental characteristic or soil characteristic would change as a function of time. That change may um, predispose certain species to be in communities and, and exclude species from, from coming in based on their species, their niche tolerances, their tolerances. Um, and so that would be an example of allogenic succession. Okay. I can go into more detail on that um, in class if people would like. Yeah. Um, all right, and I still talk about historical contingency a little bit. Um, I'm if I can remember, I'm gonna delete this part because I don't think I've introduced what neutral theory is yet. And so having that sentence here doesn't really um, contribute anything. It just confuses, sorry about that. We will talk about neutral theory, I believe. It basically takes the assumption that um, species differences and demographic rates don't exist, that all individuals in a community can have, regardless of species, can have the same demographic rates and then what, so that means species are functionally neutral. And then looking at subsequent dynamics and how that can explain some patterns of community uh, composition and structure. Uh, it's kind of cool. I don't know. Um, all right. And then I end with, uh, so if we know this, if we have this full, we, have, we know what species niches are, we know what species are in the regional species pool, we cut down a big area and just destroy all the species there. And we know, like, why can't we still predict what species, what the ending community will look like after some time T? Um, and there's at least two reasons. And one of which we've already talked about, or both of which we've already talked about, so that's kind of cool, it comes in full circle. 
Um, the first being historic, historical contingency, which also called redefined as a priority act, where um, the timing and arrival of species fundamentally changes what species can come in after. So the order of arrival species changes the, uh, the later composition. And I talk about propagule pressure here. Yeah, and I, so I define propagule pressure as the number of individuals or the frequency of, of dispersal events into a patch. And so different patches, if I like cut down um, and like destroy all the species in some plot in um, a tropical rainforest, it's going to have a, a definitely a different sort of rate of colonization. Um, and if I cut down, if I just like remove all the species in a, a small desert plot, right? Because not only because the regional species pool is different, but also the, um, the propagule rain, or like the number of dispersing individuals that would come to uh, that site varies sort of um, um, dramatically. Um, and then I also did, I introduced the term biotic resistance, um, which is kind of, it's a neat concept. It's basically the idea that uh, later on, as you, or not later on necessarily, if you have a very species rich community or a, a community of a certain composition, it could actually stop the invasion of a species. Right. So let's say everyone's blue species was excluded. Let's say it wasn't allergenic species, uh, species allergenic succession. So it wasn't due to changes in these environmental conditions that led um, the blue to get removed, but it was actually com com the competitive pressure from these three species. If you were then to try to reintroduce the blue, so an individual of blue that was out here or some number of individuals attempted to colonize this patch, biotic resistance is the tendency for that community to reject the invader by competitively excluding it. When environmentally it's fine to persist, it can, it can totally live there and, and thrive, um, but it does not, it's not able to. Um, the second reason is why all communities aren't predictable or why we have trouble, we struggle with prediction in terms of community composition is good old stochasticity. And so we went over stochasticity when we were talking about population dynamics in the form of demographic stochasticity and environmental stochasticity. Um, the inherent randomness and probabilistic nature of birth death processes, especially when patches that are new tend to be um, colonized by small populations, right? Founder populations, as they're called, tend to be quite small. And so demographic stochasticity can have like a huge influence on the resulting population sizes and the subsequent community structure if, uh, I mean, competition is a density dependent process. All right. And also demographic stochasticity leads to species extinctions, at, especially at low population sizes, which can also influence community composition. Um, and then I also introduced the term competitive indeterminacy, which I already introduced in the competition lecture and it fit better there. So I actually won't go into that. Um, but here I, I find it as a lack of ability to predict which species in a competitive system will go extinct. So that's, that's, that's pretty close, that's good. So hopefully that wasn't a little bit, that wasn't too scattered. I'm going to change the notes a little bit. And so by the time I release this video, these notes might be slightly different. Um, but yeah, I hope that was, um, that was informative. We can cover all of the, uh, all of your questions and then um, sticking points in class, obviously. There are people watching just online that are not associated with the class. I'm sorry if this was confusing, um, but yeah. Thank you very much and uh, take care.